Hey, what's up? Hello. I hope you all are doing well. New year, new calendar. 2024 can only mean a Q4 wrap up and an end of year review. 2023, as I think we all can relatively similarly reflect, uh, was an extraordinarily challenging year in many regards for many people. And I think that that is why this year I went down a path of the books of least resistance. Books where I knew what the ending was going to be, even if I didn't know how they were going to get there. Books where the writing style was easy, I didn't need to grapple with the content or the context or the way that it was written. In so many, so many cases, I just chose the easy way out. And it's a little bit hard to reckon with that, looking back on it now and having to say that out loud. But there's always another year to try for more things and achieve different goals and read in different ways. And hopefully that's what I will do in 2024. But first, there's a little bit of wrapping up to do. Let's go back to October, A Week to be Wicked by Tessa Dare. This is book two in the Spindle Cove series. I believe that this is, if not an Avon romance, it is at least, you know, it's a mass market paperback romance. And my rule with these is that I will not read them unless they have something to do with Scotland. This one was pushed in front of me by some algorithm that came up in Libby and it was stated that it was at some point set in Edinburgh. So of course I said okay well that meets the one benchmark. I will give it a try. Uh, the writing in this was actually quite good. I think this is probably the second or third Tessa Dare book that I have ever read, or at least it was at the time. Uh, and I was disheartened to find that this book actually did not take place in Edinburgh, but the characters were on a journey to Scotland for the most of the story. But that, uh, that wound up being okay. Uh, the Spindle Cove series is about a group of young women who are sort of sent to this coastal town when they are of society, but they're just not really uh, performing. Either like their season is going poorly and they're not, they're not making a match, or they seem to have health problems, or people interpret them as weird, and they go to this area to sort of restore. So all of the uh, main characters in the Spindle Cove series have like a very feminist, early feminist bent going on here. And this is actually the only book of this genre I have ever encountered where the main character wears eyeglasses. So that was fascinating to see that play out and how that affected other characters' perceptions of her. So I read this book. It was not at all like Two Scott to Handle. The writing in this was was actually quite sound. It was the genre that it was, obviously, but the writing was was decent. Then we got to November, in which my library book club read Olympus, Texas by Stacey Swan. This was a book set in the American South and tried to follow the lives of folks who were loosely based on characters from Greek mythology. Definite family drama, definitely had a lot of hallmarks of the American self. There were a lot of guns in this book, which I had not encountered before. Uh, there are a lot of secrets being kept and people kind of actively hurting each other for power and glory, but sort of the watered down versions of power and glory uh, that we would see in regular human life as opposed to Mount Olympus type life. So this was interesting to kind of see the allegories between the characters in this book who were people and who their godlike counterpart might have been in the myth and to follow along with the stories of those myths and what parts were act accurate to those myths and as much as accurate could be with mythology uh, and which parts were not. So this is definitely one I would recommend a if you love a family drama because it was extraordinarily dramatic in more ways than one and also kind of like uh, Greek mythology, which is not really my area of expertise, but I know enough about it that this book was interesting and uh, finely plotted, I would say. Also in November, I managed to acquire a Kindle. And I don't know if I've talked about it before here, but I know I have talked about my famous dislike of e-readers. And now that I have one, something possessed me to own one and now I have one. And um, it has proved to 
very much changed the way I read, changed the speed at which I read, and actually the place in my house that I read. I'm much more inclined to read in different rooms than I was before now that I have this. It's it's a weird it's a weird vibe. I'm still getting acclimated to it. But this next book was one that was pushed to me uh, through the through the Kindles, like here's some books that you might like. And it was <laughs> I can't <laughs> can hardly talk about this. It's called Some Like It Scottish by Patience Griffin. And I recognize that this is now the second quote unquote like Highland romance book that was served to me through some type of algorithm on a device. And you would think that after the first time I would continue to be skeptical, but you know, this was set in Scotland and I was like, all right, well, we'll try it. It was the second or third in a series called Kilts and Quilts, and it was absolute garbage. I think the review that I left on Goodreads was something to the effect of, uh, there's a moment in Sarah Dessen's The Truth About Forever where a character named Christy refers to a group of guys, and she refers to them as completely undateable. And the guys in turn say, we might be undateable, but that has not, you know, stopped her from having dated all of us. And Christy replies to that, well, that's how I know. And that is immediately what I thought of when I ended this book, because this book is completely unreadable. And I know that because I read the whole thing. The plot is contrived. There are too many moments of secret keeping and miscommunication, which I'll say are the hallmark plot points of any romance novel. There is secret keeping and there are communication issues and that is what the entire storyline hinges on, right? That much is obvious. So there was too much of that. The dialogue was overwrought. It suffered once again from uh, calling people by their names when there's nobody else in the room with you, which I'm very much convinced that that people just don't do nearly as much at least in my part of the world, uh, than as it's written in books. And everyone seemed to develop these very strange, like, little pet names in the book. There was, uh, forced quilting, essentially, is what I'm gonna call it. Like, there was no other way for her to continue, or the author, rather, to continue this series with the quilt angle, other than somehow finding a way to force it into every novel. And it did not absolutely not jive with the rest of the plot, which is this woman who has like a matchmaking business, and she wants to set up a satellite area in Scotland. It's not it didn't it did not work. I can't even give any more words to this. It, it was no one star. It was a book. I followed that up, of course, with any Duchess will do. Uh, and for those of you playing along at home, that is number four in the Spindle Cove series. So Any Duchess Will Do by Tessa Dare, yet another book in that journey. So now I have read in the series of six different works. I've read book two and book four. I don't know what's going on, but those are the ones that came out of the library. This book was interesting because it involved uh, not two individuals from high society, but it involved one who was of a lower class. So it was interesting to see her try to reconcile the class differences in that story in a way that she has not normally, or most books don't normally in this genre, uh, when you're just dealing with two people who are, are of a certain class in England in the 1800s. I followed that with a very short read, which uh, those of you who have been keeping close track will remember. It's called Feel the Burn by Andrew Schaefer, or perhaps Schaffer. Unclear. Uh, this book, you may recall, I had extraordinarily high hopes for. This is a Bernie Sanders mystery uh, where it features him and his Gen Z intern going on some trip that he has asked to, been asked to attend because he's going to lead a parade and there's a murder that happens there and it happens to be in the intern's hometown and she has to look out for the senator. Anyway, they team up to solve this mystery and not tell anybody what's going on and there's like a very hallmarky like, oh, we have to save the bed and breakfast or we have to save the town or we have to save the festival vibe happening here. My expectations for this book were way too high, way, way, way too high. In the first three pages alone, there were three inaccuracies that could have been easily Googled. And I know that because I am from Vermont. I know enough about the city of Burlington 
that I can tell you that had he, the author, spent the time doing a quick Google, some of us wouldn't be upset. Also, they gave Bernie Sanders a real penchant for Vermont maple syrup, and I don't know if he's working with true information from the senator, uh, but I happen to know people in my personal life who work for the senator, who I have yet to confirm this with, but I'm pretty certain that, you know, Bernie Sanders may not be originally from Vermont, but he spent long enough time in Vermont that he probably is not going to claim to like the uh, most golden, delicate, and light maple syrup out there. And that's what this book spends a lot of time on. They like really ramp up the fact that Bernie loves maple syrup. And we don't actually know if that's true. That may or may not be true. But let me tell y'all, the light stuff, the delicate stuff, the extra, extra fancy, as it used to be called, that stuff is basically sugar water. We make that for tourists. Just saying. That would never, ever be true. Don't read this book. <laughs> read this book. Next we move on to another book club book called The Dictionary of Lost Words by Pip Williams. Uh, this book is a deviation from my easy read romance rabbit hole and this was the story of the women who were in the background of the very first Oxford English Dictionary that was being put together and its publication and the things that happened therein. The story follows a girl called Esme who sits under the table um, for her childhood at her father's feet when he is helping to put together the dictionary uh, and picks up all of the words that kind of go discarded and she gets on this kind of a personal journey around what do words mean and why do we use them and whose words are they and what happens to words that are predominantly associated with women and do they get the due and the respect that they deserve and who uses them and who really decides what words make it into the dictionary based on their meaning and who decides what words mean. So she follows this whole arc across the majority of her life. And it's a fascinating look at a topic I don't think a lot of people think about. There's a map in the front of the book, which I also loved. And surprisingly enough for me, there were a lot of references to Scotland. So I appreciated this a lot due to that. Uh, the writing was fantastic. The characters that you care about were well developed. Uh, and I think I gave this book four stars. I would certainly recommend this as a read, particularly if it's something that you want to read with a group. I then took two steps in the other direction and found uh, both of these novels by Alyssa Sussman called Once More with Feeling and Funny You Should Ask. These are kind of, these have very much the same vibe. Uh, one is sort of focused around a woman who is a pop star and makes it to Broadway and it's very much like an enemies slash rivals to lovers vibe and I think the other one is very much um, a movie star and a journalist and they have this meet cute and this sort of insta love attachment that can't really go unnoticed and then they drift apart for 20 years and then they have to come back together and they're repairing their relationship etc etc their contemporary romances uh they both have to do with the area of performing arts i think i preferred the first one that took place in a broadway setting much more than I did. Funny you should ask. These were generally good. Both of the women who are the main characters in them grapple with a lot of questions about what it means to be a woman in the spotlight and what is due to them based on their work, how their work is perceived based on who they are and the attributes about them and their relevance to other people who have fame and how they will be remembered and how they will be perceived and what do you trade off as somebody who is in the spotlight? What do you give up and what do you gain from that? So that was an interesting piece that I don't know that I was fully expecting from books in this genre. Uh, but yeah, both were good. They're cute. In Once More With Feeling, I'm just gonna come out and say it, Harriet deserved better. Just saying, Harriet deserved better. If you've read either of these, I would love to talk about Harriet in the comments. I then found my way into a different easy read romance rabbit hole uh, with a series of books that, surprise, surprise, was pushed to me by who else? The Kindle algorithm. And this was the Clan Kendrick series by Vanessa Kelly. I began with as apparently I am wont to do, the second in the series called The Highlander's Christmas Bride. And I looked at that title and I looked at the cover and I was like, oh boy, we are in for it. And I hope that this is reasonable. Interestingly, there is so much depth to the story of Danella, who is the lead 
uh, female protagonist in this book. There is so much depth to her story that you kind of, you can't forget that she's in this romance situation with the other character. Her name is Logan. Uh, it's like, this is way too modern a name to be happening here. I don't know if Logan is really a modern name, but it felt very modern based on the other names in the book. Uh, and essentially, this book and this series, the Clan Kendrick series, uh, follow a group of Highlanders, the Kendricks, and there are a bunch of men in this family. I think it's like there, I think they actually might all be men and there's five or six of them and I'm pretty sure all of like the brothers get married off as the series progresses. Uh, but this one takes place around Christmas time. They deal interestingly with the idea of Christmas and what parts of what is now the UK celebrate or don't celebrate Christmas based on the predominant religions. Uh, there's a lot of like angry grandfather energy coming from a man called Angus, which is wonderful to read. There are children in this book. I was kind of delighted, although I think the title is pretty hokey uh, and not in, like entirely relevant to the story. The fact that like they get married around Christmas is not really relevant to the rest of the plot. So that was interesting, uh, but definitely started me down this train since these characters are actively from Scotland. And you know what? They're well, they're well written in terms uh, of the different pieces of Scots language that get used. So I appreciated that too. Someone did a little bit of research for this. So these were these were in the same vein as Spindle Cove, which is great because now that I had read books two and four from the Spindle Cove series, obviously was, I was on an extraordinarily long waiting list for the first book in the Spindle Cove series, which has a different type of cover than the others. So I'm wondering now if these books, which I think were published like in the early 2010s predominantly. I'm wondering if these are now having some sort of resurgence and they're giving them like more modern contemporary looking covers as opposed to you know the the classic thing we think of when we think of an Avon romance. Nobody is windswept on a mountain. In fact the cover of this one uh, was a very illustrated like a cartoonish illustration. So I finally got off the waiting list for A Night to Surrender by Tessa Dare, which, lo and behold, finally the first book in the Spindle Cove series. It very much helped to fill in some gaps that I had had about the series so far uh, and begins with Susanna, who is the person who even started the whole vibe of Spindle Cove uh, and how she was in poor health and had to come here and make this place her own and decided that, you know, she had women in her life that would benefit from some of these different things that they learn and do there and just kind of getting away from society. So it helped to fill in a lot of those gaps. It helps to figure out where the military even came from because for a place like this it doesn't seem like they would need a military regiment in the 1800s. Figured out why that happened uh, and I was grateful to this book because it it did kick things off and looking back should have read it first. So again, if you're playing along at home, I've now read the first three of Spindle Cove and uh, only the first one of the Clan Kendrick series. So now I'm balancing two, <laughs> two different series and two different parts of, of the UK in the 1800s trying to keep them all straight. And the stories and the characters did start to blur in my head at this point, just in the swirling haze of everything else going on in the month of December. Followed that with The Highlander Who Protected Me by Vanessa Kelly. This is the first of the Clan Kendrick series. Look at me backing into things. This is hopefully the last time I ever read things out of order because I've done it twice in the last year and it's not fun. It's not fun. It's confusing. It's extraordinarily confusing. But in my defense, I also thought when I picked up the second in each of these series that I was really probably just going to read that book and like call it a day. And yet here we are. Now, let me tell you something about the Highlander who protected me. Number one, main character's name is Royal. I don't know what's happening there. I'm gonna have to look up whether that is some sort of traditional thing. But the main character's name is Royal. And there's a lot of scandal in this book. And there are so many problems that would be easily solved if people weren't so intensely prideful about their war in injuries. And I think this is part of what got me confused between both series. It's because both lead characters in both of those books that are both the start to series had a guy in them who was being aggressively prideful about a war injury and it was the same injury and both of the women that they eventually wind up marrying have to you know work to be like you can't be 
so like hopped up about your knee all the time like it doesn't make you less of a person and I understand I understand that like that was of the time where if you were not 100% able people looked down on you society is still that way today let's be real however the tone of both of these very much gave like oh wives are now the rehabilitation centers emotionally and physically for men and for husbands which I didn't love but no wonder these books got crossed they filled in a lot of gaps for me about the series but that also came up maybe they're written by the same person maybe both of those authors are just using pen names who's to say the romance genre is wide and vast but I found it very fascinating that that was a connection between both of those two books finally in December I ended with three books that were just not even in that genre at all. I picked up Pineapple Street by Jenny Jackson, which is, surprise, surprise, a family drama that we are reading for book club this month, January. And this was a story about very high society, like wealthy New Yorkers and their children, and how they are managing their property and estate and sort of having these realizations after being aggressively wealthy about where their place in society is and what what do they owe to other people not monetarily but you know as a community and they make a bunch of changes to their lives they reckon with each other people are like fighting it out verbally in a lot of ways and it's at the end of the day it's kind of a story about acceptance I found this book really really heavy-handed like you're just kind of getting hit over the head with like okay yeah we need to be good to each other maybe we should have done that from the beginning but in some ways it's easier said than done the author is a woman who is the executive of the in the publishing industry and this is her first novel so no wonder it got published but it's just a lot there's I mean it's good it's fine it's very easy it's breezy it's it's very much contemporary family drama I could see this very very easily being adapted into a television show there's some great like fiery moments in it where you could definitely give like an end of episode cliffhanger yeah I think that's how I feel about it it's so heavy-handed that it feels like it could be written for television and it feels like it was written for television it was fine. After that I read Four Aunties in a Wedding which is the sequel to Dial A for Aunties by Jesse Cusitanto and wow equally as impressed with this as I was uh, with the first one. There were moments that I was cackling aloud. I as usual I love the fact that this author likes to write in the way that she has heard her family speak and not translate the Mandarin or the Indonesian and you as an English speaking reader just kind of have to move along with that and recognize that you're not going to catch some of what's said just the way uh, that people who don't speak English uh, the same way that that I I do I can't understand things that I say and she re she just prints everything the way that her her family speaks and it's wonderful and the Oh, the people in these stories you can just imagine them as real folks and I actually think the first one is getting made into either a series or a film something like that but it's being adapted for television allegedly and I'm eager to see it play out because I think it's gonna work well on screen these books are so fun once again there's another mystery uh, for these aunties and the main character to solve and they're they're dealing with lo and behold secret keeping and miscommunications throughout the entire time and I just love the fact that she's modeled uh the, the author Jesse Sutanto has modeled all of the titles of this trilogy which it will be I think the third book is coming out this year she's modeled all of those titles off of very classic uh murder mystery type titles Dial A for aunties four aunties in a wedding I don't really know what the next one is going to be but I bet you it's going to be in the same vein really looking forward to the third one if you haven't read these and you're in the mood for something very light this is this is a book for you I finished the year with Tracy Lang's The Connollys of County Down which I think I picked up off the shelf at the library because I had seen it go by on Goodreads at some point and was like oh yeah that cover looks familiar based on the title I thought this book was going to be set in Ireland it was not did I read the inside flap before I picked it up and still believed that even though it said nothing about it being set in Ireland on the inside flap? Yes. So imagine my surprise when in fact it was set in the United States. I literally did a double take back to the inside flap when I was like eight pages in. This book is an interesting exploration I think of the American criminal justice system with 
more of a lighter touch than a book that's like oh this is an FBI novel and it's much more humane and emotional in that regard. I love how it kept shifting perspectives. So you got the perspective of every character who was in the house. It follows primarily this one woman, her sister, and her brother. Uh, the woman has just been released from prison for a drug charge, drug trafficking charge, and she reconnects not only with her family after having been gone, I think, for four years, uh, but she also reconnects with the police detective who put her in prison and how that definitely follows in an interesting series of events. I loved the interaction between the siblings. I loved like the tension that came from one of them in particular, the older sister Geraldine. I loved the inclusion of a small child. I guess it wasn't really a small child, they were like 10 years old, but the thing that I think was a little bit lacking here was the the title is connected to an idea that's in the book. And I see what the author was trying to do. I, I think it was just like, oh, I'm going to drop this in here to make some of this make sense. And it could have been more eloquently or smoothly done. But overall, like, if they had just taken that whole part out and replaced it with something a little bit more vague and not named it as the title of the book, I think this book would have read the same way. So that was an interesting choice. Either it needed to be more fleshed out or it needed to not be there at all. That's what I'm trying to say here. It was fine. It was fine. But I liked this book. Uh, it's still pretty much being classified as new by my library, so it's pretty recent uh, and I would recommend it if you're interested in any of the things that I've just described about it. So overall in 2023 I read 11,404 pages according to Goodreads. Uh, the longest book I read was The Hotel Nantucket by Ellen Hildebrand, which I definitely recommend. I really enjoyed that book and I'm certainly going to check out more of Ellen Hildebrand's work this summer. I feel like she's a very summer writer and because she focuses on Nantucket, which is a seasonal area in many regards, it makes sense to keep in that vein. And last year I read 38 books. So I read three more than my Goodreads goal, which was 35. And 35 is the goal that I've set for myself in 2024. I've moved away, I think, from setting really hard reading goals. And mostly this year I want to continue to read diversely, which is the idea that we do in book club. It's the types of books that might not ordinarily come to the table, authors that might not ordinarily come to the table. Um, book club is now a situation where I, I continue to curate the list for everybody, but we now choose between two. So some of what I read will be uh, influenced by what the group wants rather than just what um, I put together for the book list. I want to finish a lot of the books that I've halfway started this year. So the library book by Susan Orlean, I have only halfway through that and have been halfway through that for pretty much exactly a year now and would like to finish that up. Remarkably Bright Creatures also want to finish reading that and I want to stop sort of taking the easy way out with um, easy read romance books this year because while they do have their place and they are great and they are you know serving a role in the world of literature don't let anybody tell you otherwise it's starting to feel like I'm a little bit too comfortable in my reading and there's a lot of books behind me that I'd either want to reread or I haven't read yet uh, that I am eschewing for these things that are very easy and I, I essentially know how they're going to end. And I think I want to be a little bit more uncertain about plots and my reading in there. So we're going to try to get away from some of that, but not until I finish both the series that I'm currently in. And I think there are only about six books in each series, so it won't, it won't take long. They are not arduous for me to read. So looking forward to that. I would love to know how many books or what types of books uh, folks are thinking about reading this year, 2024, in the comments. Or if you've read any of the books that I've described, I'd love to chat with you about those too. As always, you can find out whatever you might want to know about us from the links in the description. Thank you very much for watching, and we will see you very soon.